And let's take our Bibles now and we will turn to the book of Acts in chapter 12. And uh, we'll begin in verse 20, verse 20 of chapter 12. And uh, we'll we'll let the children go to junior church. Acts chapter 12, verse 20. Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus the king's personal aide, their friend, they asked for peace because the country supplied uh, food, the, their country supplied uh, with food by the king's uh, by the king's country. So on that day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of God and not of man. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry And they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now, Father, we pray that you will bless the reading and the preaching of your holy word this morning. Oh, Lord, that uh, we know that the preaching of the cross is to them to perish foolishness. But to us that are saved, it is your very power. It's the things that changes our lives. It's the things that that comforts our souls. So, Lord, we pray that the, the reading and the preaching of your word this morning will do its work. You promise that uh, your word will not return to your void. And we pray, Lord, that uh, the word will sound forth from this place. No matter what the opposition is, no matter what the uh, the spirit of the age is, we know, Lord, that uh, you to- told and promised that, uh, that uh, you are God and uh, that Jesus is the Lord, and that upon that rock, upon that uh, that unmovable doctrine, that unmovable truth that Jesus is the Lord, that you would build your church and the gates of hell would not stand against it. So we pray, Lord, that you would build your church even this morning. We see all the sin. We see the, uh, the corruption. We see, Lord, the iniquities, that uh, spiritual wickedness in high places. And yet, Lord, we know that you're on the throne. It looks like the world is uh, going totally out of control. But even with it uh, going out of control because of their own confusion, we know, Lord, that uh, within boundaries, you control everything. So we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you will have total control of our lives, that we will not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Use us, Lord, for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we tie this last section of the first part of the book of Acts, we see that uh, now uh, after uh, chapter 12, we'll see that Luke takes the gospel or he records the gospel going uh, all over the world and especially uh, to the West. And so we see now that uh, that these first several chapters that deal with uh, different multiple settings and different conflicts and how that the gospel was coming out of the Jewish um, doctrine or the Judaism. And it was coming now, the church now is being established. The temple will be destroyed within just a few years from now, within a generation. And there will be no worship of, uh, of the Lord as was the Old Testament. We are in a whole different dispensation, a whole different age, and the church is definitely distinct from the Old Testament way of of, of worship and the Old Testament the temple. That the temple and the sacrifices, as we will see in the book of Leviticus, every, every chapter uh, the Lord speaks, but everything in those, that, those uh, chapters of Leviticus point to the cross. They point to redemption. They point to the Lord Jesus Christ coming. And so, yes, there were things that uh, even in the sacrifices and so forth that we don't offer today, 
but they were there as an example, and they were a forerunner of what Jesus Christ did. The lamb had to be perfect and without spot, and that's the one thing that uh, the book of Leviticus brings out. And what was the Lord Jesus Christ? Was he perfect? Was he without spot? And so we see that it was all the culmination that came um, through our Lord Jesus Christ. But in the, when the Lord Jesus Christ came, uh, he didn't come into a pristine world. We know that there were there, there's always been opposition. There's always been monsters out there that would destroy the work of God all the way back to the Garden of Eden and the serpent, uh, right on through Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. You see all these, uh, you see these people who would destroy the Lord, and yet he, his word always goes forth. And now he says his church will go forth. And as you look at this man, Herod, we know that his granddaddy, his, fa- his grandfather was named um, Herod, or uh, that, that was the title that he was given, and uh, <clears throat> he was called Herod the Great, and uh, he was one of the great monsters of, the, of history. You remember the story about how that the wise men came looking for the Lord Jesus, and that uh, uh, he said, uh, who is he that I may go and worship with? And so if you find him, let me know, of course, just so that he could kill uh, the king of glory. And so there's always been that opposition. And of course, when he was made a fool of, just like uh, Herod Antipas, his grandson, is made a fool of in chapter 12, we see that uh, he went out and he avenged himself by killing uh, every child in what would be like the county of of Boone County uh, under two years old. Now, of course, that was um, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, the the area around there. Uh, And of course... uh, uh, he killed thousands of children just so that he made sure that he got the right one. But he even missed the right, the right one. Herod was a very strange man. He was uh, very intelligent in some ways. He always knew who to play the winner. And he, uh, he uh, was whenever uh, Julius Caesar and Mark Antony and Cassius, and you heard some of those terms, when they were all fighting each other about who was going to be the king or who was going to be the leader, he always was able to pick the right one and even change sides when he needed to. And then he also married uh, into the Hasmonean dynasty, which was corrupt at the time, but he was able to marry into it and then rise from uh, its ashes because of his friendships with the uh, the different Roman generals. And uh, all this happened before the Lord Jesus came. Now, the one thing that made him so popular with those men, though, whether it was Mark Antony or, or, uh, or later Octavian, who became, uh, who became Caesar Augustus, uh, was that he was a, he 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 was great at raising. He was a good administrator. He knew how to raise taxes. Isn't that great? I mean, you know, he's a great politician. He knew how to raise taxes. And he got a lot of wealth, a lot of his wealth, from uh, the Jewish people there in Palestine. But no wonder you could understand how that uh, the Jews hated publicans and sinners, because, especially publicans uh, or tax collectors. And it all started really with, uh, with Herod the Great. And, of course, you know the story about how that... Uh, <coughs> that uh, he tried to kill the Lord Jesus. And um, then, and he, but even with that, you know, Herod had already started having some real problems because he was married more than 12 times. Uh, he knew how to marry. He even married Cleopatra for a time. Uh, just, uh, he was quite a character. He married a girl named Miriam, and this, and this Miriam was the one that, uh, that this son came through. But you remember the story about... Um, about John the Baptist, and he preached against uh, the Herod, Herod Antipater, who uh, had uh, who had married his brother Philip's wife. Well, that was another mother's son, and so he want, and so you can see how this family was so corrupted. But uh, Herod Herod had, uh, he was he became very paranoid by the time the Lord Jesus came along, and he even had killed Miriam, and uh, that 
think a lot of people feel like that's why when he really started going downhill, he had all kind of guilt about it. But uh, he became, he even killed some of his own sons because he was afraid they were going to take his crown, his, uh, his power away from him. Isn't it interesting? The older people get, and you see it in politics all the time. Here you've got all these old people, and yet they're still clinging to power. Isn't, I mean, don't we not have that in our country today? And there's something about power that once you get it, I mean, you learn how to keep it, and you become very ruthless. Now, not all the time, but uh, here we see more often than not. And so he had become extremely ruthless, ruthless, and um, and he, well, like I said, the family was in turmoil. Now, after he died, then you hear about those tetrarchs and uh, other, the different people that uh, took his place, and that was one of the tetrarchs. Uh, Herod Philip was who who's lost his wife Herodias. Now she was also a player. She knew how to play the different men, and uh, she had kids from about four or five of the different uh, of the different tetrarchs. And uh, talking about a confusing family, you can imagine. Back when I was a, a young person, well, I'm still a young person by eternity standard, but. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, remember, there was a, a show called Peyton Place. Remember, it was an old nighttime soap opera. And, I mean, everybody was marrying everybody, and everybody was sleeping with everybody and all that kind of That was back in the 60s, which was, a, was, a, uh, was slanderous. And uh, you would say, uh, you know, if, if it was a corrupt place, or you'd say, oh, man, this place, this place is like Peyton Place. Well, this, was, this would make Peyton Place look tame what was going on with all this intermarriage and Herodias running around with illegitimate kids and uh, all the different things that were going on. And, uh, of course, you know that, um, that uh, Herod Antipas, or we saw, notice there's five of them here, and I've, I've listed them for you, Herod uh, the Great, and then uh, Ar- uh, Archelaus, if you remember him, and Mark Ch- uh, Matthew 2, very briefly, because he didn't last very long, because the Jews hated him, and uh, he, they hated him so much that, uh, that uh, Caesar, Augustus, called him back. And, of course, that's when, uh, when Joseph avoided Jerusalem and went up to Galilee uh, and uh, was out of his jurisdiction because by that time, no longer did Herod have the whole area. These areas were broke, broken up into tetrarchs or into four different areas, four different sons that uh, got them at the time. And, but then what makes it so confusing is this changed from every generation because Caesar controlled it all. In fact, by the time that Herod Agrippa came along, he was so young that he said, well, I'm not going to give him a whole lot of, but they were all playboys. They were all in just, uh, uh, they knew how to play the field like their dad did or their grandpa did. And so we see that Herod Antipas uh, in Matthew 14, he was the one who killed um, John the Baptist. And uh, remember Herodias, and that's where, when he was married to her. And then because he had stolen her from, from Philip. But then, of course, he was the one that was at the trial of the Lord Jesus. So he was the one that was prominent during the, the time of our Lord Jesus. Uh, then Herod Agrippa was not his son. His son was uh, uh, his, excuse me, uh, uh, his, uh, Herod Agrippa's father was Archelaus. So you see how all this, play, this played around. And that's why it's so confusing. But Herod Agrippa of course, uh, he killed James in chapter, and, but there again, why did he do it? Because he tried to please the Jews. He knew how to play the Jews against the Rome or against the Romans, and uh, of course, he knew how to. He knew which side of his uh, the bread was buttered, and so forth. And so we see that these all these men were playboy philosophers, playboy politicians. Uh, their morals were. Uh, like some of the campuses we have around here today, uh, just horrible situations that were going on. Um, and uh, then, of course, the last uh, Agrippa that we see is, uh, is the second because we know that this Agrippa died, and it was later on that Paul met his son, Agrippa the second. And then you see Bernice and some other family members that are all part of, of uh, that over in uh, Acts chapter 25 and 26. But they were all ruthless men. They didn't mind killing, as we, we have seen and we even see in chapter 12 of, uh, of the book of, uh, of Acts. 
uh, they sought to please the Jews and uh, the Romans too. Uh, they were extremely immoral, and they all met ignoble ends. So they all tragic. Uh, if they were good men, they would be tragic ends. But we know that uh, Herod the Great uh, died uh, from his own men. I mean, uh, they had to kill him. <laughs> he was he got so bad. Um, Archelaus uh, died in Rome, and. Uh, then we have uh, Antipas, who was exiled and uh, later on died um, as a nobody. Uh, Agrippa, this Agrippa, we see that he's going to die. And in fact, this Agrippa is mentioned by Josephus. And you've heard me mention Josephus. He lived about the time of, uh, of the apostles, about the time of Jesus, and on into the life of Paul. And uh, he even records the, uh, the dramatic uh, and detailed, or he gives a detailed account of the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. But he writes about this man. And he tells us that, uh, that, <coughs> that, this, uh, that uh, Herod Agrippa had um, been miraculously brought up from the ashes. In fact, he was on the wrong side of the Romans. And uh, like so many of the others, they had finagled their way out of it. But uh, he was told that... Uh, and by by uh, Josephus's account, that uh, that you were going to get out of this, but you won't get out of things like this again. And if you see an owl, you have five days to die before you die. Now this is this is from Josephus. Is Josephus right? That when you compare Josephus with Luke, who do you take? You always take Luke. But it's interesting how they kind of uh, they add to each other, and so. What happens here is that uh, Josephus says he saw the owl. And five days later, he died a very excruciating. Notice John or Dr. Luke says he died from worms. Well, I, I don't know what worms, what happened in your body uh, with the worm. If you die from worms, I imagine it could be pretty, well, let's not get into that too deep. But, <laughs> but you can imagine. But, uh, but here we see then, that uh, Herod Agrippa, then he notice he was angry with the Phoenicians, and as a result of now the Phoenicians were traders. In fact, Carthage, Hannibal fame, was were actually Phoenicians. Uh, Tyre, of back in Solomon's day, they were great traders. And remember, Paul, the, the, they did a lot of trading, uh, even back then with, during Solomon's day, uh, with Tyre and with Sidon. And so these were traditional trading cities. And the one thing, as we see even in the passage here that Luke says, uh, Jerusalem, even as today, uh, that area of Galilee down into Judea was the breadbasket of the Middle East. Even today, that is very true. Have you ever gone to the, um, to the store and picked up Israeli oranges? I have. And one time I went in and there were some, I'm always looking to see where oranges are from since I'm from Florida. But uh, I, I bought some Israeli oranges as recently as two or three years ago. Because, they're, I mean, they're just, they are prolific. You know, God has blessed that land. And so this was the bread basket of the area uh, during this time. And Tyre and Sidon, those big, huge cities, they depended on it not only for their own food, but they were able to ship it out all over the world and make huge profits off of it. And so we see that this Herod now is, um, is the Bible says that he is very upset with them. And they say, oh no, we can't lose this trading partner. And so we see that he says, and uh, they, came, they came with him with one accord and they bribed good old Blastus. Does that sound familiar today? Pay to play. And here Blastus is um, the king's personal aid. And so they had to have an ear to, for the king and they ask for peace. Now, that's why they, why the first lady of any president is so important. Not because she has any power, but they call it pillow talk. Why? Because if they get to her, maybe she will say something to the president. And that's always been true. It's not who you know, it's who you know who knows. And so uh, there again, I, I read the power game one time by a, a, a correspondent named Hedrick Smith. And he said, if so many people go to Washington and they try to talk to their senator or to some dignitary and they have no idea. They said, what you've got to do is 
that dignitary you don't get a hold of, you talk to the secretary. You talk to the people who talk to the man or the woman. And so it's so interesting how that, uh, because the, the man, he's going to give you 15 minutes of his time, and that's going to be about, or the the the, the person, or the, the official. But uh, if you could sit, and he talked about how the people have gone and sat for 45 minutes in the secretary's office and didn't say a word. But he could have been talking and shacking up a, you know, and then he only had a five-minute session with the, the leader. And so there again, this Blastus was a guy who got around. He was a guy who knew a lot of people. And we see that they knew how to get to him. And they said, you know, Blastus, why don't we have this big uh, coronation together? And we are going to, or this thing, and we're going to honor Herod. And uh, now that uh, that stadium where they were is still in existence there in, in Caesarea. And we know, and it faces the sea. And you can stand <clears throat> on the uh, west side of that uh, toward the sea and preach up into the, into the arena. And you can see those, that, that uh, circular arena is still there. And it would be a very picturesque place uh, when the sun's coming up and shining out of, of up and above over the Mediterranean Sea. And of course, if he's wearing all this gold or the silver and laden material, then it must have been quite a spectacle. And so the setup was there. Now, unfortunately, when you do this, you'll always have those people who knew what they're doing, and then you have the, the populace who doesn't know. And so there were people probably there that thought he was God. But uh, most of these people knew what they were doing. And so we see, so on that set day in verse 21, um, Herod, arrayed in royal peril, peril so sat on his throne and gave an oration. We're going to let the guy speak. Probably wasn't a great speaker, but uh, uh, but there again, we're going to let him speak. And the people kept shouting. And you can imagine the people that started it were the very people who set it up. The people kept shouting, the voice of God and not of a man. Be careful. When you, like we call it hubris, we call it, there's something about power. And again, uh, that is why so many times in the second terms of presidents, they have more trouble because they're used to the power and they're used to getting things done their way. Generals have that kind of problem, especially if they won a few battles. Uh, you have that kind of problem if you have been successful at a few things and maybe have a good job and uh, everybody likes you. Uh, we all have that problem of hubris, that idea that, uh, hey, I don't need God. You know, it's a lot harder, I found in my life, it's a lot harder to praise God and to thank him when everything is going right than when everything is going wrong. It's easy to forget God when you have a full refrigerator, when you can uh, call out for pizza at any time, when you don't have a, a worry in the world, you got a nice house, it's easy to forget God, isn't it? And there's a lot of people that are forgetting God. What will God have to do to our country? What will God have to do for Bel to Belvedere for people to realize that they need God again? One reason that uh, churches are not <clears throat> full today is because nobody needs him. They could say, dear heavenly government, rather than dear heavenly God. And so we see that uh, this man, though, I mean, nothing like flattery. And that's why as a pastor, I've tried to learn uh, never to accept flattery, <clears throat> always to reflect it on the Lord. All oh, pastor, that was one of the greatest messages. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad that God was able to use me rather than whatever. I try to, so I will, at times, if I don't, I'll just say thank you. But I know that it wasn't me. If anybody got anything out of it, I just pray that God was that used me through it. Because, you know, pastor, you or the voice of God. No, I'm not the voice of God other than I'm an oracle of God. You know, but uh, there again, I do, now that doesn't mean that I don't mind people letting me know that they were blessed by a message. In fact, I've learned <clears throat> when I go to, and I'm blessed by a message to let the pastor know or the preacher know because they need it just as much as any of us encouragement along the way. But at the same time, we see that he took it and he said, you know, I am a pretty good guy. And notice he did not reflect 
or he didn't. And the Bible says he, that, uh, and he, and he kept shouting, uh, he's God. And then the angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. He didn't say, hey, I'm not a God. You'll notice in the Bible, every angel who was ever uh, fell down and worshiped, the Lord told him, I mean, the angel said, get up. Whenever Paul was in Galatia and uh, they called him gods, he said, get up. Uh, when John was in the book of Revelation and he fell down at the angel's feet, he said, get up. Uh, because angels don't re will not accept the worship of their Lord. And so be careful about praying to angels, folks. Be careful about those who really exalt angels, even above the Lord Jesus Christ, or, or even exalt saints above the Lord Jesus Christ. I will pray to my Saint Christopher. I'll pray to, no, there's only one mediator between man and uh, God and man, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. So be very careful about how you treat God. God doesn't like his name to be thrown away, uh, thrown away, thrown around in vain. In fact, he says he will not hold him guiltless who does. And so we see that uh, that <clears throat> that Herod, <laughs> he kind of got on a trip like his fathers did and grandfathers did. Hey, I am a pretty good, I am a very powerful God. And so as a result, or a very powerful person. And so he accepted it. And uh, I don't know if Josephus is right, he saw the owl. But if Josephus is right, uh, then five days he had excruciating pain before he died. Uh, nothing like dying in gastrointestinal pain. I mean, um, cancer patients that I'm in the hospital with, or what, they give them morphine these days. But all oh, the pain that go, people have from, from internal pain, from sicknesses like that. But we see now that that. The Lord has ways of taking care of you know each one, and yet in spite of this, we see the word of God multiplied, and that's what John, what Luke is trying to get across here. Is in spite of all these evil men, men killers, they killed you know they tried to kill the Lord Jesus, they killed John the Baptist, they killed James, they they just they they weren't above murdering anybody. And they were very vicious, mean people. And they were able to use very vicious, mean people. The Pharisees were not very nice themselves, were they? Especially at the murder of the Lord Jesus. And so we see that but the Bible says, in spite of all that, the word of God went forward. Oh, the pastor, you don't know. Boy, these days are just really rough. No, they've always been rough. Some part of the world, some part of the church has always had persecution. There's always somebody who's had to go overcome something in order to serve the Lord. And here we see that in spite of the fact that the Roman Empire was now going to be persecuting Christians, in spite of the fact that uh, all these problems are going to come up in the church as they were trying to establish the church, yet the Bible says in spite of the things that are going on, don't forget uh, this is right after uh, James has been killed. Peter has had, and now is in exile. I mean, he had to leave Jerusalem, remember? And all these things are happening, and yet the Bible says the word of God is going forth. The word of God is going forth. And so we see, and of course, you know, the folks, uh, as I study, they call it the 1040 window. It's uh, the latitude 1040, where most of the people of the world live, right across India, right across Turkey, but and so forth. But some of the most persecuted areas in the world is where we're seeing the greatest fruit in missions today. Not in the developed countries like Japan or France, but in those Central African Republic, that's not south of the 1040 window, but right across that, the Muslims uh, land, the, the, and uh, India, Burma, all those played right into China. In fact, uh, I have a friend of a friend who just, uh, that friend just came back from China. And, you know, it didn't take much for them to have, form a house church. And they could have Bible studies because people were hungry for the word of God. They knew their government was not feeding them. 
and at the risk of their own lives, they were willing to come and uh, have a hidden Bible that uh, they could <coughs> share. Well, I, I got a stack of Bibles at home, and so do you. But what if, can you imagine? Just, okay, uh, I can't have it, but can I have part of the Bible to take home with me? And yet this is where the gospel is going forth. Tertullian, one of the great church fathers back in the first 400 years of the church, said the, the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. In other words, those who were dying for the Lord, the more that people were dying, the more people were saved. And this is exactly what we see here with John or with Luke, where he says that the gospel now is the word of God grew and multiplied. And so we see now the next generation, or we see now that Luke is preparing us for that great worldwide expansion of the gospel. Because we notice that Saul, Barnabas and Saul, notice he's not even called Paul yet because he's not to the Gentiles. When he went to the Gentiles is when he started being called, started being called Paul. Uh, Saul was his Jewish name. Paul was a Hebrew name. Or excuse me. The, Saul was his Jewish name. Uh, Paul was his Gentile name. And so we see that uh, that <clears throat> that uh, they went back. Now, remember, they had been sent because of the famine. And there again, there's another problem. There was famine, and that's probably one of the problems that they were having with the Sidonians and with the Phoenicians was, hey, listen, we're not producing enough food ourselves. And he got mad at them and frustrated, whatever. So all this politics was playing all into this. And so we see that um, that uh, that Barnabas and Saul, had, had to, remember they had relief. They went down, down from Antioch with a load of supplies to the church of Jerusalem. And they were returning now. Isn't it interesting how that God had uh, pre preserved them and protected them? And yet he had allowed James to be killed? Hey, that's not fair. Why is it that God, the Lord allowed this person to suffer persecution and another person escape? He's a sovereign God. And folks, uh, simply because you're going through trials and you say, well, Lord, why isn't everybody else going through trials? Well, don't try to get everybody else to go in trials with you. <laughs> you know, God is using you for a specific pur purpose. Did the word of God go forth in spite of James being killed? I think it's one of the things God was saying. I don't need apostles. And by the way, uh, Barnabas and Saul were not original apostles. So we see a whole new generation of, of, uh, of people that are going out. And then, of course, then you have a new generation by age with uh, John Mark, who, of course, we know had his, he had his problems. He was the uh, cousin of Barnabas. His mother was Mary, uh, the uh, owner of that big house there in Jerusalem. Probably pretty wealthy, so he wasn't quite ready to, I mean, to suffer all the problems. And remember, he came back after just a few days on the mission field, but he was reclaimed and he wrote the book of Mark. And so uh, there again, simply because people fall or people don't make it the first time doesn't mean that God can't use you. And there are people here that, uh, oh, I tried to serve the Lord, and man, I didn't make it. Well, listen, the Bible says, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God's not through with you yet. And so get up off your haunches and realize that God has a purpose in your life. I don't care whether you're 9 or 90, God still has a purpose in his, li his life for you. And John Mark is one of those great examples of that. A guy who was probably a fa failure in his early 20s, but by the time he's 40, he's writing the second book of the New Testament. And so we see that God knows how to use those who will stick with him. He also knows how to reclaim them. And so we see now that God is ready to use these people as they go forth. For And they notice this, the word of God. The gospel goes forth. Um, and the word of God grew and multipl uh, multiplied. And God will use those who will live for him. Are we willing to die for Christ? And you say, yes, but you know, really, 
you think about it, James had an easier time than Paul did. Is James in heaven today? Is James uh, right next to the throne of God today? But he never had to suffer all the things that Paul did. And yet Paul said, I finished my race. I finished my course. And so precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saints. God knows when the best time for us to go. Why does the Lord take a, an 18-year-old aspiring Christian and they die in a car accident? And then you have others that live 70 years and don't do much for God. Does God know what he's doing? I don't understand it totally. But uh, I think James has got just as many accolades and crowns in heaven as Paul does, don't you? God is not a respecter of persons. He knows how to use each one of us. And one of the problems that we see with those who live is those who were during the reign of Queen Mary, they were willing to be burned at the stake. But when Queen Elizabeth came on the throne and the, the country prospered, many of them fell away from the faith. So maybe God needs to keep us with a hammer over our heads. Maybe God needs to work in our lives and cause us to have struggles. I like what my home pastor, 94 years old now, love him to pieces, but I never will forget. He said, you know, and, he, and when he said this, he was on his back because he had <clears throat> real back problems. The first deacon's meeting, he always wanted me to go to him just to learn a little bit. Uh, well, I, the first deacon's meeting I ever went to, the preacher was on his back with his feet up in the air talking to the men around him, you know. But he said, I never will forget, he would say, you know, the Lord keeps me on my back to keep me on my knees. And that's so true in our lives, isn't it? God has to allow the persecutions to come. The Lord allows the trials to come. The Lord allows the tragedies to come. And But, the, but in some strange way, whether it's James or Paul, God receives the glory. And he will not share that glory with those who want to be equal with him, as we see with the Herods. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Never forget where you were, where you came from, and who made you what you are. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know him? If you don't, you're missing out on the key to eternity. You're missing out on everything. Just like the Herods, just like those who had it all on earth, but lost it all in hell. Do you know the Lord as your Savior? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Now as we would go into the time of, of inspecting our hearts as we would come before you at your table, Lord, we pray that you would work in our hearts. Expose things, Lord, in our lives that we have placed in front of you some God that we have, or Lord, just the, just the fact that so many times we get so busy with our own self-sufficiency that we don't even need to sing, I need thee every hour. We don't pray without ceasing. We don't rejoice evermore. We don't keep you in our thoughts. We don't do everything for the glory of God, whether we eat or drink. Oh, Lord Jesus, may we realize that you are the king of our lives. Let us crown you now. May you become the very heartbeat of our lives, the reason we want to live, the reason we want to, to live is because we want to please you. And may we sense that smiling face as you would look on us, Lord, and one day, Realize, as Paul looked for that great time when he could hear your voice say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Bless your people now, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name.